Welcome everybody to Sunday Mornings with Twitchy Women. And today I'm very excited that we have Donna Gow from Medtronic and Lisa, Liza Bobrow, who's a patient advocate who had DBS. And they will be talking about the latest on DBS from Medtronic. Oh, audio Okay. And uh, can I ask everybody to turn to mute themselves, please? So we don't have uh Okay. Ashlyn, do you want to just mute, mute them um, for me, please? Thank you. Okay, so uh, Donna is a senior DBS therapy specialist for Medtronic. Uh, she's in the San Francisco Bay Area. She's been with Medtronic for 15 years, supporting uh, neurosurgeon movement, disorder specialists, nurses, patients, caregivers, and support groups for DBS for Parkinson's, uh, essential tremor, dystonia, epilep epilepsy, OCD, and more. Uh, her role is to educate all, physici including physicians, nurses, uh, and patients and families before, during, and after DBS. Prior to that, she worked for another neurostimulator company for epilepsy and depression. She currently lives in San Francisco with her husband and 10-year-old daughter. And um, I'm going to let you go ahead and introduce Liza, I keep saying Lisa because my son-in-law's sister is Lisa, uh, but I'll let you go ahead and introduce Lisa, who is Liza, sorry, I keep doing that, Liza, um, who has been um, a part of Twitch movement for a while. So welcome both of you. Okay. It's all yours. Thank you, Sharon, for that kind introduction. Good morning, everyone. I'm just going to share my screen here real quick. So you can see the slides. Happy Sunday. I appreciate the time to, uh, sorry, I just need to move here, to be able to be here with you all. And my goal is to give you some very specific information about the most advanced DBS therapy that is now available on the market. Unfortunately, we launched the newest, most advanced system during COVID. So trying to get the information out has been more of a challenge, especially this is a new system in terms of how to treat patients and make it more personalized. And I'll get into the details. Uh, Sharon so kindly Hello. told me that you guys have, that y'all have had a lot of talks about oh. PD and just deep brain stimulation in general. So this is a little more special than that. I am gonna show you some of the details. I usually show the physicians, the surgeons and the nurses uh, so that you can get more information and more specifics because I know part of the challenge these days is not only do you have to decide, do I want DBS or not? Now you decide which of the three options from different companies that uh, you want to do. It's just a lot and it's overwhelming. So I will be happy to be a resource and, and any of the Medtronic uh, consultants across the country are happy to help you with that as well. So you can always contact me offline. So before I get to the details of the actual implant and why we can claim to be the most advanced, I want to reference a few things about DBS so that you can see why Medtronic chose to advance the therapy in this direction. And it will probably become the buzzword, just give it a couple more years. So a lot of these slides are from my corporate office. So you'll see that they're a little generic. So I apologize, we'll skim through most of them. The um, agenda is in general, not everything we're gonna cover because most of you already understand what this is. But just as a point of reference, it's been almost 30 years since Medtronic first brought deep brain stimulation to market. And it was initially implanted in 1991, approved in 97 for Parkinson's disease and essential tremor. We've always based okay. our advancements on evidence and clinical studies, as you can see, and we are worldwide and we continue to do so. We will not make claims without having lots of evidence to back it up. In fact, I think Ventron is even a little more on the conservative side compared to other companies, but we want people to trust in us and what we say and do. As you can see, there are five indications that Medtronic system is approved for. The newest one is not just advanced Parkinson's disease, but recent onset, which means recognizing and planting sooner rather than waiting 18 to 20 years when the quality of life that most people are suffering with, right? So also essential tremor, dystonia, and epilepsy. 
living with Parkinson's, I don't need to explain to you all, right, that it is different for every person. You hear it from your, your support groups, your female colleagues here, from every physician who treats you, right? If we are claiming and saying it's different for every person, no one person looks alike. Physicians often say, if you treat one person with Parkinson's, you've treated one person with Parkinson's, right? Then we need the therapy to be more personalized and not just more personalized to be able to adapt to what you need in your day-to-day -day changes. We do want to focus on, right, what does deep brain stimulation do? It looks at the movement disorder symptoms, the improvement of the tremor, but you don't need to have tremor to have DBS. Slowness or bradykinesia and stiffness are the main improvements, right? But tremor is also a home run. So it's either or. And really, what is the goal? The improvement of your quality of life. It doesn't matter what we do or how we do it. We just want you to have a better quality of life. That means being able to get dressed by yourself, being able to socialize, drink your glass of wine, go out to dinner, right? Or doing the hobbies that let you interact with you or friends and family, like sewing or cooking. So we really want to focus on when should you be looking at DBS, right? When you're seeing your med doses increase and the effectiveness is decreasing. The involuntary movements, the dyskinesias are there or increasing, or you're just having side effects. The reason I bring these key points up which you all are aware of is these are again, more targeted and specific and more personalized things that we're seeing how we can treat better with this new advanced DBS system that Tronic offers. I love this slide, which you have probably seen a million times over and over, right? About the fluctuations in your day. So keep this screen in the back of your mind. So when I show you what we're looking at with the brain sense technology that Medtronic offers and only Medtronic offers, because it's going to be related to this to understand. While the green zone tells us we want you when you're on time, we know you're fluctuating in the grays throughout your day, even when you're having a great day. Our goal is to limit those. And let's say you're doing great for a week with your DBS therapy. It's on 24-7, which in the future, we are looking to change that, which will affect battery life. What happens if you all of a sudden have a day or two where you are having so much dyskinesia or so much off, you'd have to manually change something, medication or your DBS. But if we can get the system to adapt and to recognize, hey, when you're in this gray zone, you're in your optimal. But if you go anywhere outside this gray zone, your brain signal will tell us, what will the DBS do? Will it be smart enough to know I need more stim or I need less, less stim? And that's where we're at. And the pathway to that is with the Medtronic Percept system, which is now available. And it's through brain sense technology. So I don't need to explain to you, as Sharon has said, you guys all know what DBS is, what it can and can't do. We know we call it a small pacemaker-like device, right? For those of you who have not seen any of these talks, it's implanted all underneath the skin. It's FDA approved, even though there's still some insurances who say, hey, we're not gonna cover that. They all cover that. It is FDA approved and it is reversible, which I think is key because if Parkinson's found a cure next year, you can explant the system. And that's important to know. Again, we know what are we trying to do? Improve quality of life, your motor symptoms, reduce your medication, which we can promise to do, right? We can make that claim and get you to not wear off 24 seven. You've probably seen all the studies on what initially deep brain stimulation can do, which is increase your on time without increasing dyskinesia by at least five hours a day. Personally, if I had five hours extra better a day, I'd be super happy because as a working mom, <laughs> that is not an easy chore. Again, improvement quality of life. But key, I, I think we're taking it to the next level, right? I talked about personalizing this therapy. So not just improving your quality of life, but let's make it better for you, in the, which may be different for somebody else. And to be more fair and balanced, safety, it's still a surgical procedure. It's elective. There are risks. But with all the improvements and the experience we've had over 30 years, right, we've seen these risks decrease. But I just want to make people aware that there are risks. And when should you consider it, right? It's not a last resort. These, this is how we basically tell a general neurologist. If you've had Parkinson's patients um, who have had four years or more of diagnosis, they're having a lot of fluctuations, 
they're still responsive, even if a small window to your levodopa medications, but they're having just movement issues that the medications aren't helping for at least four months. That is basically the gist of the qualifications of when you should be looking at DBS and discussing it and maybe meeting with a surgeon for consult. You can meet with a surgeon for consult, doesn't mean you have to move forward, but I think getting your questions answered to reduce anxiety is key. And Liza will probably share a lot of that story with you. Okay, I like this slide because we talk about this window of opportunity. Remember, our goal is to get you to optimal and the sooner the better, right? And to keep you in this throughout your life. It's kind of what physicians have told me when the DBS is working, right? We're going to keep you in that holding pattern of where you are good as long as possible through the years and progression of your DBS. For the movement symptoms, we may not be able to help the other's issues like, um, like cognition or constipation or GI issues. But I think that if you have the ability to check the box and not have to worry about your movement disorder or your movement symptoms, you have more time to deal with the other issues. Okay, so we're we're gonna talk now about the new device, why a lot of you logged on, right? The implants and the programming, right? So if you get your surgery, you have your leads implanted, you have your battery and your extensions implanted, you're gonna recover and then go to programming. Here's where we're at, right? With the new devices. What's the difference between Medtronic and the other two companies that make DBS now? We call our system the Sensite lead and the Percept battery. Percept is the PC. So the directional leads are called Sensite. They're not the only directional leads available to be transparent, but they are the only ones that allow for sensing. And you'll hear the term. And the extensions are also new and those are Sensite as well. The battery is called Percept PC. You'll hear this called the battery of the neural stimulator. And that goes in the chest like a brain pacemaker we mentioned. It is been designed to be smaller and thinner than previous devices, 20% smaller, thinner, and more comfortable. And the battery is set it and forget it. You don't have to charge. And we are seeing on average for new patients about five years, which is unheard of because every DBS non-rechargeable system in the past was lasting about two to three. Even though it's an outpatient surgery, right? Most patients don't, sorry, let me go back. Do, uh, still didn't always want to have a system that they needed to be uh, at outpatient surgery every two years. And we do make a rechargeable version for those who decide down the road, I want to go that route. And there's a pros and cons. So with this Percept system, here is a patient, Sharon asked me, let's talk about patients who've been implanted with the Sensite Percept. This is our friend Jason here at UCSF, one of the seven centers I cover, Stanford included. And he came in um, for his first initial programming appointment about a month after surgery, and you saw he could not walk. He's a young guy. His wife was videoing. We He's off medication. We turned on the DBS and look at him now. Uh, we were blown away. You saw the nurse get excited. And why were we able to do that in under an hour? Because this is what the physician and the nurse is looking at. This bottom screen here is your brain signal. Remember I talked about that curve that we're monitoring? We're listening to your brain with this Medtronic system. We can hear and see the brain signal and what it's doing. And we know when it's up, you're symptomatic. Stimulation is not on. Our goal is to suppress this peak, right? To smooth out, which would correlate to symptom benefit, the stiffness, the rigidity, some dystonic feet. So here she goes, she's turning the stimulator on and you can ask to see this when you're at programming, the staff, physicians and nurses are always happy to show. See this bottom line, it's indicating, hey, we've turned the stim on only to half a milliamp. And are we starting to see some changes? Yes, and let's go up a little more. So just know in the brain, these oscillations or fluctuations are normal and expected. Every brain has it. But in for some reason in movement disorder and Parkinson's, it's more exaggerated, right? And see, now it's starting to suppress. So once we get that, you saw Jason start to walk. We wanted to stay on the lower end as possible. And she was able to do that. 
And so that tells us we are stimulating in the right part of the brain at the right stimulation. So again, in this cartoon video that the corporate office has given me, this is your brain signal. The peak on this bottom picture, lower left, is this patient having stiffness, rigidity. We turn on the stim, that peak starts to get suppressed and now his symptoms are better. This is all done with the Percept Brain Sense technology. So keyword is brain sense you'll hear. I mentioned earlier to some of you that we want to make the system smart, smarter. Just like the smartphones have changed the world for us compared to when we all had flip phones or no cell phone, right? The DBS system by Medtronic is the only one with brain sense technology to give you a smart DBS. And again, this is what you would see. One of the other things that it's not on the slide is in this Percept system that is being implanted now, whether you have new implant or you're an existing patient, like Trisha said, you can get this system. It is backwards compatible to take advantage of these features. Um, the software also in the system is upgradable. So the Medtronic believes in this advancing the system, this adaptive capability so much that they've already put it in the device. It has not been FDA approved yet. We are already working on the studies. They're ongoing right now. The physicians I speak with are so excited that they have seen in the blinded phases, great response, it's working. So as soon as that's FDA approved, hopefully in the next few years, maybe even a year, year and a half, I don't know the time frame. then all it would take is if Liza goes to see her physician when they communicate in what we call interrogate the device with the programmer to program it, it will unlock the software and ta-da. So no surgery needed to get that feature. So that's why it's key now to, to ask for what you want and why it makes sense to say, hey, I want that system now because you're only gonna have your surgery once. That's the goal, right? barring infection that Trish mentioned. It is, you know, choose the right leads. These are done, one and done. So it's really key to think that through in your decision-making. Now the slides are changing to blue because these are the ones I show the physician, right? We talked about these enhancements, these advancements that we've made to deep brain stimulation. It starts with a sense side directional lead and goes to the percept device. I'm gonna show you what the lead looks like. So it's got the four contacts here in the silver. Um, for each lead, you have one on the left brain, one on the right. And as you can see from the slide, these are enhanced leads. They were designed and made from the ground up by Medtronic for DBS, for sensing, for this goal of adaptive STEM. So other companies may want this technology in the future, but they outsource what they buy. Even that is true currently. Only Medtronic manufactures the battery and all the components in-house. That's why the quality is bar none, because we are making what is needed. And it is very hard to read brain signals that are a million times smaller, right? But this is why we use proprietary material that we have purchased from NASA. So that's kind of a cool factor to be able to tell people, Liza, that you have NASA grade quality material in your deep brain stimulation in, um, implants. Um, and many people, you know, the buzzword for a long time was this segmentation or directionality, and that is a feature in there. It may not be used all the time. What we're seeing is that it's mainly for side effects um, from STEM or while the brain is still recovering from the surgical procedure and that you would use these, but then maybe go back to something different. The extensions are also new. The Sensite extensions are 30%, about 30%. Um, thinner than the past, and they are more flexible than in the past. So less pull and less discomfort over time. This is not something we usually we discuss with patients. This is something the surgeons are always very excited about. This is the burrow hole cap that goes over uh, the skull where the implanted leads go into the brain. And you can see they are a much lower profile. It's a clear cap than what they have been in the past. Patients who know somebody who's had DBS in the old days would see, especially in the men when they had their shaved head, little horns that they would see. And they have asked us to make them flatter and lower. Even though it's only a 14% lower profile, every patient and surgeon has told me it is very, very significant in what we are seeing so much that they don't have to recess the, the burr hole 
to keep it flatter. And what's also nice is in the um, advancement of this, there's been 14 enhancements about securing the lead and allowing uh, decreasing the ability for issues. Um, this slide, they just want us to show that Medtronic is committed to the system. So we make a lot of things at Medtronic, not just deep brain stimulation pacemakers, software for brain planning and tumors. So all this is part of our system. They are all made to work together and the physicians use these in the DBS surgery and then it just really clicks well together. Same idea. Oh, I, I do want to go back to this just because of based on what Trish said. This device here in the lower left, this antibacterial pouch is called Tyrex. I think this is important when we talk about, we were talking about issues women deal with. So in the chest area, right, the ratio, I think, of fat to muscle for men is different than women. And this is a product Medtronic purchased um, the company to, what it is, is a mesh pouch that goes over the implant in the chest all still underneath the skin and i like it because i think for women it helps the device secure down if you're thinner or you feel like it would move it's meant to be antibacterial to decrease infection risk but it was first indicated for adhesion to the chest wall while the device was healing so just know that is also available. And I think it's more, it's a, a discussion I bring up with physicians uh, for female patients. Uh, just to remind everyone, again, we are worldwide, worldwide. So when you have a Medtronic system, we will always be able to help you wherever you go in the world, find help, care, physician, or support by the company. Um, I've had people travel to Europe, say, I lost traveling my patient programmer. Can you get me a new one? I'd FedEx it to them where they are because they're there for a week or two and they need their system. Just a reminder, we also do make a rechargeable system, but we won't get into that right now because I think you guys want to know about this new technology. This, now we're going to cover the, uh, the battery, the Percept. So just like a computer, right? All the hardware and software for driving the technology is in this battery system. We call it the battery because it the battery is in there, but so is all the software that makes it able to have brain sense technology and be the smarter battery. We already discussed that it is sleeker, smaller, and thinner than the previous generations of device. I think this is our fifth or sixth generation of a deep brain stimulator um, neuromodulation um, implant. And this is just to show you guys, people often ask, you know, how is it able to not be damaged by so many things around our world, right? Um, I think Sharon brought up radiation therapy. I've had a patient have um, breast cancer and they had to radiate over her chest where the device was. And we checked it multiple times after 12 radiations, the device was not damaged still. So we feel good about the technology that we have. It also allows for more advanced treatments in MRI. In terms of battery life, it is now, again, we mentioned longer than um, the older systems for the patient who has the average settings. Now, if you're on the extreme side, then you know it may not be that way. And that's when we would discuss the uh, rechargeable version that is coming out later this year. And again, I just showed you what is isolated in that system. And that allows for the only 3T MRI conditional DBS. It's full body. So if you ever need an MRI or, you you know, I've had physicians say this patient has a history of cancer and they're going to probably need MRIs in their future. We want the Medtronic system because it is easier and has more um, labeling that allows for better imaging. What does that mean? You know, a majority of patients will need MRI in their lifetime, and it can get very complicated. There are more 3T machines out there than the 1.5T. That's just the strength of the scanner. So getting an appointment will be easier. You can see the techs know what to do. They have more ability to get better imaging, which is the whole point of getting an MRI. In addition to that, Medtronic is not just the only system that's approved for 3T scanning. It is the only DBS system that allows you to be safely uh, on during a an MRI. So what that means is we give you the special bipolar setting. It's an MRI group of program that lets you have stim on safely so that you can lie there for 30 minutes comfortable, not have your DBS system off, not get rigid, not have tremor. And 
be, you know, thinking, I don't think I'm going to be able to get through an MRI scan without being sedated. So this is a big deal we've heard. I've been at hundreds of MRIs over the lifetime of TBS that I've been here, and it's a big deal. The newest um, feature for you as a patient is that you don't have to rely on your physician or Medtronic rep to come to your MRI anymore. So if you live four hours away from a center with the Percept system, your patient programmer has an MRI mode. It will test the safety of the system and let you put yourself into an MRI group as long as the physician has programmed it. So it gives you a lot more independence. Okay, the last feature we're going to talk about is this brain sense technology a little more in depth so you know what you're getting. Basically, we've already showed you what we're doing, right? We're finding a brain signal with the leads, the system, the percept system is sensing it and giving us a chance to record that data. It saves it to your chest device, not to a cloud. So it's all very safe. Um, so your data is not out there floating for anybody else to see. And what it's doing on a 24-hour basis is telling the physicians when they see you this, um, this picture on the far right. What you're seeing is midnight to midnight for a specific day, which would be highlighted here in the, you can't see it, let's say uh, February 7th. For February 7th, this patient did sleep decently, got up probably around five o'clock and you know, was having symptoms because the brain signal woke up, maybe took their meds. Yeah. Which is indicated in the plus, And we saw the symptoms come down. Did it come down too much and make them dyskinetic potentially? Because these bars here are representing where you're on and optimal without dyskinesia and without symptoms. High peaks means symptom, low peak means dyskinetic. Middle, right? More even is where you're doing well. So what this is doing is telling physicians, you know, that you see them in a 15 minute window. A lot of you guys are saying it's not enough time. What can we do to make those appointments more optimal? What is going on in your days in between appointments where you're trying to explain and paint this picture to your physician who sees you and it, what, well, how many times have you been the most optimal when you're in the appointment and you say for the past two months, I have not been this good. Why is today the day I look good and the physician's not going to believe that I'm having some challenges. You know, uh, uh, am I taking my medications too late? Because we see this brain signal affected by not just DBS stim, but also medications. Um, um, am I not sleeping well? You know, is that why I'm having a lot of off time? Is there a time of day that I'm worse? And do I need to address that with stim or DBS, right? This is brain sense. This is Medtronic only. And with these patterns, what we're gonna want is to say, hey, is it going to be smart enough to say, okay, when I'm having more symptoms, will the DBS turn it up just a little bit to get me back to this middle on time optimal state? If I'm having dyskinesia because maybe I took too much meds, maybe I forgot and took an extra dose, will the DBS say, oh, she's dyskinetic, let's turn her down for a little bit until we can get it back to optimal? And that's what Medtronic's Percept will do for you. So outside of the clinic, it's telling the physicians what you can do also telling you per group when you're most optimal. So we have all this data now that can drive, right? What the physicians need to do. It's not an art, it's more science now. I think it's nice because you're gonna combine the art and their experience with all this information to make things better and getting there better faster. One other um, point of information you can provide the physician, it's optional, you don't have to do this homework. But if you say, hey, I usually keep a diary and I tell my physician, I write down when I'm having bad days, um, when I'm doing well, and it's it's a little cumbersome, but I do it in a notebook. Well, if you say there's four key things I want to tell the physician, we can set that up so that your smartphone that we give you, what's called the patient programmer, all you would do is take your finger and tap, I took my meds today. And you don't need to do that every day. In the beginning, we say maybe do it for about a couple of days or a week before and after your appointment. What does that do? It overlays that into the brain signal we're reading and helps them even more with, you know, why? Why is, why are you peaking at this time? Is it, do we need to move your medication 30 minutes? Is your medication not working? Do we need to change it? Does the DBS stem need to be changed? So all this is available at your fingertips now with the Medtronic system. And the other key improvement is battery life. 
in the old days, it did not give you in years and months how much better you have so that, you know, you love your system and all of a sudden you think, is it going to just die on me? Is it unpredictable? No, it is predictable. And you can see it every time you go see the doctor on the big tablet or, or your nurse or on your handheld, you can check it. It says here more than two years, right? It gives you in your, so you can plan your life. If you're going to go on vacation, the holidays are coming up. You can say, Hey, I want to schedule that battery change around what I have planned in my days. So I think that's the majority of what I wanted to cover. Um, this just kind of gives you an idea of why, why are we doing this? Right? Because we need to make it better and easier for you all and personalize it and give you smarter because I love this quote from a female patient, Sarah. She says, I see my physician for one hour, right? And there's a, <laughs> we're lucky if we get an hour and it's the red dot. And that's what the, we have to do to manage her disease and her life and her quality of life. But all, all these other hours of her day, they don't know about. And these are the ones she has to live with. And she's trying to tell them what it's like. And it's not easy to do when you have 15 minutes with a physician or an hour with a physician. But if they see what your brain's doing, it takes just a couple of minutes to look at that data that we're providing. So all that's available, the electric diary, the brain signaling, the recordings. I think there's just one more, and that's what we're looking at, right? The in-clinic live streaming, we're listening to your brain where it's telling us what it needs. It's telling us what it's doing. It's telling us how it's responding to TBS stim, which in the end, right, is going to be time saving. This is the slide I told you guys. Uh, I think this would be the last one to reference, right? This is your brain signal. This is what the DBS needs to do to respond. It's in an inverse relationship. So that is the value about why we say, you know, think about your choices and what you would like to ask for. And hopefully I've given you enough information about why it makes sense to, you know, look at the Medtronic system and ask for that. Right, data, data, data. And that's pretty much it. Uh, Liza is 57 years old and was diagnosed with Parkinson's five years ago. And she works in advertising as a finance and HR director and lives in the Bay Area with her husband, her 14-year-old son, and two whippets. She loves gardening, cooking, and eating, of course, at crosswords and finding inspiration in her surroundings. She had DBS surgery a year ago at UCSF. And look at that gorgeous hair. So didn't have it, she didn't have to sacrifice her hair to have the surgery done. Uh, Lisa has been part of Twitchy Women for several years, and we I'm so happy that to welcome you back. So it's Thank all you yours. Much. It's awesome to be here and to have this opportunity to share my story. I have a couple slides, which are mostly silly pictures, but I thought that they would help me guide my my little talk. So let me put those up on the screen. Quickly. There you go. Okay. Hey, can you see those? Mm -hmm. Alrighty. So this is my DBS story, as mentioned in my little intro. Thank you so much for that. I um, was diagnosed with Parkinson's five years ago, and you know I don't have to go into the details, but it was really, you know, I'd had some arthritis and some pain in my shoulder when I was younger, but I started having difficulties with my handwriting, writing very small. And I was convinced that I had some sort of writer's cramp, like, oh, I must have a pinched nerve in my shoulder. And so I went to an orthopod to say like, oh, this shoulder is really giving me some problem. Maybe I need a cortisone shot. And he had me do this, which I think is something we've all done for doctors before. And when I could not do it at the same rate as I could on my left hand, he said, you have to go see a neurologist. And I was floored. I couldn't believe it. And so, you know, that led me to my diagnosis. And um, just going to go to my next slide, although here we go. So, you know, I want to talk about how did we get to the decision to do DBS? Because you know, this is, even though it's a state-of-the-art treatment and it's been available and approved for so many years, it's not something to consider lightly. 
So when I was first diagnosed in 2018, I kind of went, I actually got to my diagnosis relatively quickly. My neurologist at the time tried me on a couple of medications that didn't work and then tried me on Cinemet. And amazingly, I had this really great response. And so that was sort of like surprise. All of a sudden those symptoms that I had had started going away. And it was kind of like the neurologist I had at the time sort of acted like I had um, won the neurological lottery, like, oh, you have Parkinson's, that's not so bad. And I kind of believed it at the time. I said, well, I'm taking this medicine and it's a low dose and I'm actually able to do most things that I like to do. I can garden, I can dance, I can write, I can type, I can work. Nobody knows about it. And I think one of the things that I've heard and that I've experienced myself is those of us with Parkinson's who can mask our symptoms, get really good at masking our symptoms. Like we don't want anybody to know it's private. I don't want to expose myself to everybody's feelings like, oh, this poor woman, look what she's going for going through, or people know, you know, an elder relative that's had this for some time and is in advanced stages and they just have this, you know, grim feeling about you, you know, so I kind of wanted to downplay it. I downplayed it to my friends, to my family, and even to myself, you know, I just would say, oh, I, I felt like I had a touch of the Parkinson's, you know, no big deal. But then, you know, what happened a couple years into my diagnosis, all of a sudden, things were not so great. I started having really painful dystonia in my right foot and my right arm. My foot started cramping, um, toes curling, and my foot started curling in or curving in. So even though I wanted to be walking on the flat of my foot, I was walking on the lateral side of my foot, which caused all sorts of pain in my ankle, my knee, my hip. And it was just excruciating. And at the time, I had no idea that this was actually a side effect of the drugs, which were the only thing that could help me, but they were hindering me as well. And I started having problems with my arm where I would reach for a shelf or something. And my arm would sort of lock out and it would just be stuck there and it would hurt and it would be stiff. And I'd be like trying to pull it back into my body and I just couldn't. And, um, you know, I determined that this was because of the peak dose dystonia that I would have when I was on medication. And then meanwhile, my therapeutic window of when the medications were actually working became much narrower and I wasn't having much on time. And so I would have, you know, basically my experience became when I was on meds, I was in pain. And when I was off meds, which became a longer and longer time, I couldn't do anything manual dexterity became super compromised. I felt like I had giant oven mitts on my hands, like anything, flossing my teeth, stirring a pot, holding a t-shirt, just like the most simple things, washing a dish, just like manual tasks. I would tell people, I'm not trying to run a marathon here. I'm just trying to like shampoo my hair, you know? And I just felt like I had these giant mitts on my hands. And so then I started, you know, by that time I had a new neurologist who is a movement disorder specialist. And I can't tell you what a difference that made to have somebody who was a specialist, understood Parkinson's, could explain to me, you're having dystonia because of the medication. Let's try some different medications to see if we can smooth out these off periods for you. So we tried a few things and I was convinced, well, why can't I just get back to where I was? I was fine. Like, just let's rewind. Let's go back to where I was a couple of years ago when I felt great and I could do anything. I could snap my fingers. I could go to dance class. I could do all this stuff. And so we tried Ritari. We tried the new pro patch, which is transdermal patch, just sort of smooth things out. And we tried amantadine, which can sometimes help patients with dystonia. None of those things made a difference. And in some cases, like with amantadine, I had some really bad side effects like wakefulness, I couldn't sleep. It was terrible. And so that became really frustrating and I felt so depressed. Like, why can't I have this? And I felt like, I started feeling like, gosh, if I feel bad now, just imagine how bad I'm gonna feel, you know, five years from now. And so my, my neurologist who actually had been a fellow at the UCSF Movement Disorder Clinic 
some years ago, she actually started suggesting DBS to me. And I thought, are you kidding me? You know, surgery, I've never had any surgery. When I was, you know, when I gave birth to my son, I had no medication. And that's a whole nother story. And I won't go into that. So I'm just thinking like, why? Like, how can this be for me? I'm, you know, at the time I was 56 years old or 55 when she recommended it. I just couldn't believe it. And she started to explain to me the benefits and that it's not a last resort. And actually they see really good results with people at earlier stages who are experiencing motor fluctuations and that I could be a really good candidate. And so I started going through the evaluation process. I was referred by her to the clinic and then I had the surgery. And so then I started going through the evaluation process for my candidacy for DBS, which is, you know, I'm, I know that we've had in this group before presentations from other women who have undergone the process. So I don't need to, to delve into this too much, but you know, I met with the team and I had, you know, a very detailed, um, you know, I met with the neurologist, I met with the surgeon, I then had on off testing. So they wanted to determine how responsive I was to levodopa. Um, at that time, with the woman who did my on off testing, we discussed different device options. And I'll just go into this a little lightly now because at the time, I was just getting up to speed on what DBS was and how it could help me. But at the time, what really stuck with me was that it was the difference between a rechargeable device and a non-rechargeable device. And that's kind of what was in my mind. And of course, you know, to me at first, rechargeable sounded like a great idea, like, oh my gosh, you know, the less surgeries that I can have, if I could have a device that would last for 10 years or 15 years even, wouldn't that be better? And so I was talking to the woman who, the nurse practitioner who gave me my on-off testing, and she started telling me that actually the technology is developing so quickly with these um, devices that actually there's something to be said about non-rechargeable because if you have a device that lasts for five years, five years from now, there's gonna be technologies you can't even imagine. And would, you know, that gives you the opportunity to have access to those incredible features that are in development that there's so much happening in the field. And that's sort of like, kind of like sparked in my mind, the analogy of an electric car, right? because we've had a couple of electric cars and you kind of think like you lease the electric car. Do you buy the electric car? The electric car that we leased six years ago had like an 80 mile range. The electric car that we leased three years ago has an 120 mile range. The electric car that we got one year ago has a 250 mile range, right? So that kind of stuck in my head and I thought, huh, that's so interesting. And so I decided, you know what? I want the non-rechargeable device. And at that time I had no idea that the Medtronic device had this brain sense technology. And I'll get into that a little bit when I talk about programming. And actually even just listening to Donna's um, presentation, I'm still like, I feel lucky, right? Because there's things that I didn't even, uh, I wasn't even aware of myself because I'm so busy focusing on my life, not the science that's in my body, you know? Um, anyway, so that's kind of my little piece about my introduction to what are these devices and what are these implants and what are they going to do? There's neuropsych testing. That was about a three to four hour test. And for somebody like me who loves crossword puzzles, I loved that. I was like, come on, give me more, except for the part where you have to memorize like nine numbers and then say them backwards. Like that was not for me, not my favorite part. Um, there was a DBS educational class with one of the nurse practitioners who's been in this field for 20 years. It was incredible, three hours. And then ultimately I was approved for surgery. They discussed the target that they were going to um, target in my brain. And for me, there are two targets for DBS, the STN and the GPI. And the GPI was chosen for me and I had bilateral surgery but I have one device, not two like Trish, but I had the bilateral lateral surgery for the GPI target. And the reason they did that for me was that they really wanted to minimize my dystonia and my bradykinesia, right? Because I did have some tremulousness when I was off meds, but tremor was not my 
dominant my dominant symptom whereas i think the stn is often targeted for people who have tremor predominant um parkinsons but i'm i don't really know all the ins and outs and then you know i ultimately had my pre op day and so this was my big day this is a beautiful picture of me that i really don't share with many people <laughs> so you're welcome that's my gift to you as you can see, I have these beautiful braids in my hair. My surgery, my surgeon was a woman, Dr. Doris Wong. And as I was falling asleep in the OR under anesthesia, I'm drifting off to the most lovely sleep. She's braiding my hair. My surgeon is braiding my hair. And it was just like such a sweet way to fall asleep. I felt so well taken care of in my surgery. So that means that they anesthetize me to drill the burr holes into my skull and then they woke me up in order to do testing as they were inserting the leads into my brain to ensure that they were getting that they were um hitting the correct target at the time and they gave me all sorts of tests so you know I had fallen asleep in this like lovely way and then woke up with my head sort of immobilized in this frame and doing all these tests and with, you know, my brain signals being amplified. So you could hear, I could hear the sound of my neurons firing. It was just an amazing experience. It wasn't painful, but it wasn't comfortable. I, I kind of joke and say, it kind of felt like if somebody's poking your belly button, really poking the inside of your belly button and you're like, stop doing that. Like it doesn't, it feels weird. It felt like like somebody was doing something to your teeth, but it's in your brain. And, you know, so I wasn't loving it, but it wasn't painful. Um, but yeah, so I went through the whole testing um, in the right side of the body and then in the left side of the body. And then they put me back to sleep and installed and, you know, did the tunneling of the wire uh, and then installed the battery. And I think the entire surgery probably took four to six hours. I'm not sure. And that was May 3rd of last year. So some people have asked about recovery. And this is me at home a couple days after surgery. And you see the picture on the left is me. I've been reunited with my beloved mascara at last. I was really distressed that I couldn't wear makeup during the surgery because I hear that's not a thing. Um, I'm also um, showing a picture of the bandage. So, you know, this is the area that they had to shave. And there was also a little spot on the side of my head that was mostly hidden. And, you know, this may seem cruel, but apparently your dog is not allowed to lick you when you're recovering from surgery. That whole thing about having brain mouths, apparently that could be a factor in infection. And so that is something that I had to avoid. Um, much to their chagrin. So that was something to work on. But when it came to recovery, like, as I mentioned, I think earlier, my pain was not that great. I did have some headache, but it could be managed by um, Tylenol alone. They gave me oxycodone, but I really didn't need it. Um, the worst headache that I had on a scale of one to 10 was probably about a six, I would say, and it diminished pretty quickly. I will say that the soreness in the chest was probably more, you know, I don't even want to say worrisome, but it was definitely there, you know, sleeping on that side was a little hard, but it diminished pretty quickly. And then I'll get to the initial program programming that happened 10 days after the surgery. It was about a two and a half hour appointment. And the lovely Donna Gao was in the room with me, as well as the most amazing nurse practitioner, Monica Vols, who's part of the UCSF Movement Disorder Clinic. She's an amazing rock star. And there was a neurologist fellow as well. So my sutures were removed, which meant that I got to take a real shower and wash my hair for the first time. That was amazing. Um, the pro For the programming, I just felt like my husband was there taking videos to see these three women programming this device and just speaking about this. It was just science fiction, honestly. It was truly amazing. 
the idea was, and you know, Donna can opine more on this, but they're setting the therapeutic range of stimulation that's going to be beneficial to treat my symptoms, right? And so they did a whole bunch of tests on me and de determine this range. And then they sent me home dialing the settings down to the lowest setting within the range and gave me instructions to increase that those um, the amplitude by increments every couple of days. And the reason for that is this is a very dynamic time in the healing of the brain. And so what they're trying to do is determine or determine the ideal balance between stimulation and medication. So at that time I was still taking just the same dose of medication that I had been taking. And they really wanted to see how the two of those things would interact. And so you wanna keep one of the factors, which is the medication sort of consistent while the stimulation is amped up over the, over the days. And so this is about my last slide. I think what I wanna say, because I know we're running out of time here, is that you know the communication for the programming, it's an ongoing process, right? So I didn't have like a night and day, like flip the switch and my symptoms were all gone. That did not happen for me. It's a gradual process. And the neurologist I work with, my movement disorder specialist neurologist, she says, with a GPI, the process can take longer to sort of set in and get right. And so I went in and, you know, a lot of my friends and family, they're like, oh, they're going to flip the switch and it's going to be amazing. You're going to be like, so, you know, it's going to be night and day for you. And it really, I didn't have that expectation. I knew this is for me where the art meets the science with the variability in Parkinson's sim symptoms and all of the potential and the variations that are possible for the programming of this device, it's very complex as a treatment. And so I'm aware of that. And, you know, I will just say, like, as I went through the process of going and incrementally increasing the range uh, or the amplitude as I was first recovering, I got to a point where, huh, I thought I would get more out of this. It was a couple months after my surgery and things weren't really happening. So I talked to the team and said, hey, what's going on? I'm not sure, you know, what to expect here. Maybe you can help me out. And they kind of looked at me. I talked to Monica. I talked to a neurologist at UCSF. They said, you know, you really should be getting more out of it. I went back into the clinic for another programming session in July and Monica get, ran a bunch of different tests on me and, and interrogated my device. And she made this particular change. And, you know, what it was, which she changed the location on the lead where this, where the signal was emitting from to push it farther down on the lead instead of closer up to the top of the lead. And that was like a switch was flipped. All of a sudden, my dystonia went away my motor function improved vastly and I couldn't believe it because that's the thing about the DBS stuff is that when a change is made and it's beneficial, within five minutes, you feel the difference. But that being said, you know, our bodies are always changing with PD. It's not a static disease. It's not like you just get to a good place and then you stick there, you know? That's not how it works. And so, you know, I can't stress as much or I can't stress enough how important communication and self-advocacy are because, you know, the teams, the medical teams, they have hundreds of patients that are going through the same thing. And we're, and we're the ones that have to say, reach out and say, hey, I'm noticing this. I feel this way. What can be done? Be the squeaky wheel because that's what they need and they are there to help. And I feel that I'm going into the clinic this coming week to see if I can be optimized further because I want to take as much advantage as possible with this amazing technology that I have in my body. And so, you know, it is to be continued because we all carry on 
This is a picture of me in the midst of a four mile hike with my husband on my birthday a couple weeks ago when I turned 57 and um, just enjoying life and continue living and doing my best. And I think that takes me to my end of my slides. So thanks very much for listening. Okay, so virtual tiaras, ladies, to both of you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I wish I could give you one in person, but you're 500 miles away or whatever, so it won't work. Um, so thank you, it was wonderful. Um, Parkinson's Awareness Month is not over. And I was fortunate this week to last week to be to be interviewed by Joy Cochran from Urban Polling. And if you haven't heard it, I'm on her podcast. And she they put in a lot of fun little uh, sound effects and things. It was just a, it was a blast. It was a lot of fun. So if you get a chance, listen to it. Um, next slide. T-shirts are back, and uh, the sale ends on Friday. So we have. All of our usual shirts, but we also added this one for care partners, which says I'm with Twitchy. And then it's <laughs> underneath the little thing just says twitchywoman.com. Uh, so if you are interested, um, we will, I'm not sure if this is the right link anymore, but anyway, we'll make sure you, the link will be in the chat. Um, I think we need to some, four more of these guys to have them printed. They come in all different colors. They come in black and white. But we've added white t-shirts because we've had a lot of requests for white t-shirts. So uh, same wonderful feel as the others. And your support to your women at the same time. Next slide. Um, our peer-to-peer -peer mentoring program. If you're newly, di newly diagnosed and looking for someone to talk to, this is for you. Or if you want to be a mentor, um, help someone else learn to live with Parkinson's, give us, you know, get in touch with us. Uh, just go to the website, Twitchy Woman Peer Support Program, and click on that at the top. Next slide. Um, if, if you are going to the uh, World Parkinson's Congress and haven't told us, please let me know because we will have uh, goodies for you there. Um, and we have a private Facebook, Facebook group for those people who are going. I think we have 20-something women plus seven or eight care partners going as part of our group, which is fabulous. And we just received word that uh, we submitted two abstract proposals, both of which were accepted, but the one that Susan Lehman submitted on uh, the mentoring program has been accepted for the poster tour, which is a big deal. So we're really excited about that one. And um, next slide, I think next one is, oh, next slide. In a couple of weeks, we have Robert Cochran from, from Yes and Exercise, which is improv for PD, and it's fabulous. It's a lot of fun. Uh, I encourage you to join us. And then uh, we, we are, we're only meeting once in May because of the Mother's Day and Memorial Day and other things. So then we meet again in June, and Rochelle Flanagan, who created created My Moves Matters uh, app for women with Parkinson's, and you see actions below above her. That's part of Robert Cochran. I don't know how that got moved. Uh, but she created an, an app for women with Parkinson's, especially for young onset, which where you can track your symptoms along with your mental cycle and see how they can, how it fluctuates. Um, and I think that is pretty much it. Um, our two chat groups are busy, uh, going strong Tuesday mornings with any, anything, anybody, any questions and Sunday mornings is Twitchies Without Partners. We had a great meeting this morning, uh, discussed a lot of things about advocacy when you can no longer advocate for yourself and you're alone. So we've got a lot of issues coming up. Uh, we will see what we can do about that. So um, consider supporting us so that we can continue to bring these to you, uh, to everybody at no cost. Um, but there are expenses, of course, involved in all of this. And I think that's it. 